Hi, this is Pastor Nelson Mercado. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast from the Nashville First Seventh-day Adventist Church. I hope you are blessed by today's message. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord. We have you. We can take anything to you in prayer. You're always there to listen. Thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Thank you for the power of your word. And now as we open, we pray for your spirit, for conviction, for courage, for you to open our hearts to what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there, I want to start with a story, sort of a parable. While walking through the forest one day, a, a, a man found a young eagle who had fallen off his nest. He took it home and, and, and he put it in the barnyard where it soon learned to, to eat and behave like the chickens. Now one day a naturalist passed by the farm and, and asked why was it that the king of the birds should be confined to live in the barnyard with chickens. The farmer replied that since he had uh, 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 given it chicken feed and trained it to be a chicken, he he did not learn how to fly. And since he now behaved as the chickens, it was no longer an eagle. Still, it has the heart of an eagle, the naturalist replied, and it can surely be taught how to fly. So he lifted the eagle toward the sky and said, You belong to the sky, not to the earth. Stretch out your wings and fly. The eagle, however, was confused. He did not know who he was, and seeing the chickens eating their food, he jumped off to be with the chickens again. The naturalist took the bird to the roof of the house and urged him again, saying, You are an eagle. Stretch forth your wings and fly. But the eagle was afraid of his unknown self and and, and the unknown world and jumped down once more where the chicken food was. Finally, the naturalist took the eagle out of the barnyard to a mountain. There he held the king of the birds above him and encouraged him again, saying, You are an eagle, you belong to the sky, stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle looked around, back toward the direction of the barnyard and then up to the sky. Then the naturalist lifted him up straight towards the sun and it happened that the eagle began to shake. But then slowly he began to spread his wings and and in a triumphant cry soared away into the heavens. Now, it may be that, that, that the eagle still remembers the chickens with nostalgia. It may be that even he occasionally revisits the barnyard. But, but as far as we know, he has never returned to lead the life of a chicken. Now, in, in, in a sermon titled, um, We All Need Roots, Pastor William Tuck tells of a man who steps onto the platform of uh, uh, the American uh, uh, Legion Convention, and as he looked at the crowd, he asked, can anybody tell me who I am? See, he, he had lost his memory. He had lost his identity, and his desperate appeal was, Does anybody know who I am? You know, when when you think about that, it's got to be very frustrating. I don't don't know if you've ever suffered from what they call temporary amnesia. I mean, that to me has got to be very frustrating, not knowing who one is. So, So today I want you to think about this. Do you know who you are? Are you an eagle or are you a chicken? Could it be that we are suffering from a case of identity crisis? Open our Bibles again to our our scripture reading, Revelation 12, 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. You all should know this passage by memory. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 And the dragon was enraged with the woman, 
And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. This passage should be very familiar to most of us. It is at the heart of our Adventism. It is foundational to Adventism. Now, this word for rest, the rest of her offspring, uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version, this word rest comes from the Greek lipos, and that word is translated as residue, or or the remainder of, or the remnant, the remnant. Now, this concept of the remnant is is also very familiar to Adventism. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you should be familiar with it, uh, uh, this concept of a remnant. Because the Seventh-day Adventist church identifies itself as the remnant of Bible prophecy. The 13th baptismal vow of our church manual reads, I accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. So anybody that, that joins the church by baptism or profession of faith, you know, agrees with that statement. Or at least they should agree with that statement. But now the concept of the remnant is not something unique to Seventh-day Adventist. We we don't have a patent on the word, and and we didn't take this word out of a hat. As we study the Bible, we see clearly that God has always had a remnant. Did you know that? God has always had a remnant. But now you you ask, well, well, what is a remnant? What is a remnant? Well, a remnant is simply a leftover amount uh, from a larger portion or piece of something, whether it is food, whether it is a piece of, uh, of cloth, or whether it is people. People. And although in, when we think about remnants, we, we may think about a remnant as a worthless a piece of scrap, and, and many times it is, what we find in Scripture is that God places a high value on those whom he call by his name. God has always placed a high value on his remnant, and as remnant. And, and again, there's plenty of stories in Scripture about God's remnant. You think about the first remnant mentioned in Scripture. Anybody can tell me that? Who's the first remnant? Noah. Noah and his family. Yeah, they formed the first remnant mentioned in Scripture. After every living substance was blotted out, only Noah and his family remained. And then after Noah... We come to the time of Abraham. Abraham began a new remnant. God had made a promise to Abraham that he would be the father of nations. And God kept that promise through Isaac, through Jacob, and then through Jacob's 12 sons. And and those eventually become the nation of Israel. And they, of course, in essence, become the remnant of the nations. A leftover from the world that neither knew God nor his doctrine nor had a relationship with him. Of course, we know, unfortunately, that Israel, the children of Israel, God's remnant people, did not always live up to the expectations that God had for them. Yeah. Later in history... We, we know that uh, they split into two, the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom uh, of Israel, and, and they were conquered by their enemies. Remember, uh, God had told them, and now the, the ten nations of Israel are, are conquered and destroyed by the Assyrians. The kingdom of Judah was conquered by Babylon. But yet even then, even before this happened, God promised a remnant. God promised a remnant. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. Who are left. So notice that God kept his promise. We know that the kingdom of Medo-Persia let the people, the Jews, go and they returned to Jerusalem and they rebuilt the city, they rebuilt the temple, and in essence, they become the remnant of the remnant. But see, even then, the remnant of the remnant did not live up to God's expectations either. Yeah, and so we come to the time of Jesus, and obviously I'm, I'm making a quick sweep here of the history of the remnant. We come to the, to the time of Jesus, and Jesus is talking to his own people. Matthew chapter 23, 
In verses 37 and 38, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who calls the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I, I, I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left unto you desolate. And so his own people, the remnant of the remnant, did not live up to their expectations, to, their, to, to, to what they were supposed to do. So God chooses another remnant, the Christian church. The Christian church becomes the remnant of Israel. But history reveals to us clearly that the Christian church didn't live up to God's expectations either. They didn't fare much better. And so as we travel through history, we come to the time of the end. Are we living in the time of the end? Do we believe that? We come to the time of the end where God raises a final movement, where God raises a final remnant. Now, now, time does not allow us to go through um, the characteristics of this final remnant. The Bible does provide, in the book of Revelation, a series of characteristics that help us identify this remnant. Now, we're not going to do that today. We'll do that next time, because this is a two-part series on the subject of the remnant. We're going to see how God identifies the characteristics of the remnant in the end of time. But suffice it to say, and I say this with full authority and conviction, friends, the final remnant of Bible prophecy is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Some, there, there should have been more amens here. Amen. Now, when I say that, I, I guess I ought to qualify this because Sometimes when, when people hear this, uh, the, 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 the church identifies itself as the remnant, it, it, it seems a bit exclusive for some people. And, and sometimes this is misinterpreted because the feeling is, well, if the, the Seventh-day Adventist church believe they're the remnant, they must believe that, that only Seventh-day Adventists will be saved. And that you have to be a Seventh-day Adventist if you want to be saved. And, 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 and so you are safe if you are a Seventh-day Adventist. Friends, that's not what we mean at all. This is in no way an exclusive statement as if saying, if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, you're, you can't be saved because salvation comes through Jesus. But this concept of the remnant, friends, is biblical. It is biblical. So do you know who you are? Are you an eagle or are you a chicken? Now, it's important to point out, as we look at the remnants in the Bible, each of these remnants had an important and distinctive message for the time and the context in which they live. Yeah. Who can tell me what, you should know this, but who can tell me what that distinctive message is called? Well, back up a little bit. I, I, I wrote a book about it. The present, the present truth. The present truth is this distinctive message that each of the remnants in history had. You think about Noah. Noah had a distinctive message to proclaim to the people in his time. He preached it for 120 years. God is going to send a flood, and if you want to be ready, there is a blueprint for a, 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 an ark that you can get in and be saved. Yeah? He had a distinctive message. Abraham. Abraham had a present truth. The, the, the distinctive message that Jehovah was the creator of heaven and earth and that only he should be worshipped. And by the way, this was the same distinctive present truth message that the children of Israel had, that they were to be proclaiming. You see, everybody had a distinctive message, a specific message. Now, it's interesting to know when we think about the children of Israel and their present truth, they had the, a light that went back all the way to the foundations of the earth, and, and, and that it will be repeated again in the time of the end. Let me give you an example. They had the light about the seventh day Sabbath. That was part of their, of their truth. Israel had the Ten Commandments and their pure form. 
They had a unique uh, insights on creation. They had the sanctuary message. They had the truth about death. They, they knew all about the health message, the understanding of the great controversy. They had knowledge about the spirit of prophecy. And finally, they had the news of the Redeemer, this coming, his first coming and his second coming as well. Same thing. They had this message. It was part of their present truth. Yeah. Unfortunately, as we, as we look at the Christian church as the remnant of Israel, we find that a lot of that was lost in history. A lot of that was lost in history. So God saw it fit to bring it up again because it is a message that is important to prepare a world to meet Jesus. He brings it back again. The present truth for this day. Uh, 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 and he raises this final remnant movement to preach this message to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So here, so now, so now uh, uh, since you mentioned it, Mary, where, where is it that we find this present truth? You said it earlier. The three angels' messages. Let's read it. Go there with me. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 11. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Behold, uh, Babylon is fallen, is fallen the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives its marks on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone and in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest, nor, um, nor a day or night, who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Again, this is uh, uh, the three angels' messages. And, 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 and as you know, because I preached a series on it, and that's what the book is about, is that in these three angels' messages, you will find most of what we believe as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Yeah, they are today's present truth. That is, this is the distinct message for God's remnant people for this time and in this context. However, there are many voices in Adventism today that are declaring that this message is no longer politically correct. It's no longer politically correct. Yeah, this message is too old school. Some in the church today feel that we need to leave this message behind. We need to think about something else to talk about. This message is too offensive. It turns people away. We need to repackage things. Let me give you an example. I ran into this article some time ago, and you take this with a grain of salt. I found this article in the Spectrum magazine. If you're familiar with Spectrum magazine, they could be a bit controversial at times, okay? But, but this, this article, it just reveals the feeling of many voices in Adventism today. It's written by a man named Admiral Nkube. And um, the title of the, of the article is Toward a Post-COVID-19 Church. This is a two-part article that they have there. You can look it up, Toward a Post-COVID-19 Church. Now, I will say that there are some things in this article that I resonate with, that, that, that I think are okay, that are, that are good, that, uh, as we, as, because as, as we, as we look at Life in general after, uh, after COVID-19, COVID-19 changed just about everything, right? 
and certainly everything we do in church. So, so there are some things that I, that I resonate with, but there are others that make me quite uncomfortable. And, and I want to read this to you because, again, it sets the stage to what I'm talking about here, the fact that I think that many in Adventism today are suffering from identity crisis. This is what he says. There's a deconstruction taking place among many in Adventism. A questioning of one's religious experience in search of meaning, authenticity, and relevance more than truthfulness. Let me let, me, let, me let you digest that a little bit. A questioning of one's religious experience in search for meaning, authenticity, and relevance more than truthfulness. So think about what he's saying here. Many are questioning their experience in the church because they are, they're searching for meaning, to, for, for a worship service that's authentic and maybe relevant, and that's more important than being truth that, or, or than t- preaching and understanding truth. Truthfulness now can take a second seat. Because what is important now is for us to find connection, for for us to find relevance, for us to uh, 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 find authenticity. While COVID-19 has been significant in disrupting almost every aspect of our lives, it has proven to us that many of the very things we thought were definitive to Adventism are inconsequential. Yeah, lots of things have changed since COVID-19. We learned a lot of things but, uh, through COVID-19. But what he's saying is that one of the things that COVID-19 taught us is that not everything we thought about in church is important anymore. It's inconsequential. Yeah. He gets more direct. The danger with Adventism is being out of touch. You know, I've heard that many times before. We're out of touch. And, and I will say, you know, there, there, there are those who say that we're out of touch because maybe we, we are not um, in the communities, uh, uh, helping people in the communities as much as we should. And, and I, would, I told you I resonate with some of the things he said because I, I, find, I find that this, this has been true in some, in some instances. I, I've been, um, since I've been in Nashville, I, I try to connect with certain organizations and meetings and a, a lot of them that have to do um, with Christianity and churches. And I've been told more than once when they, when they know that I am an Adventist, they're surprised that I'm, that I'm even there. Well, Adventists usually don't come to these things. You see? Being out of touch. But he has a deeper meaning here. A generation is emerging that is yearning for a brand of Adventism that goes beyond doctrinal correctness to genuine connection. See what he's saying there? This is, there is a a yearning, uh, 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 you know, obviously, you know, he's he's thinking about more about the young, the younger generation. They want to connect more. And is there anything wrong with connecting, by the way? We want to have, we want to have a, 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 a genuine family experience. I mean, this is part of what church is about, connecting, feeling at home, feeling that you're in a place where, where you feel comfortable, where people love you and they accept you and they're gracious to you. All those things are important, but more important than doctrinal correctness, according to him, about how we as, as Adventists interpret Scripture. You visit any Adventist congregation around the world, you will meet an institution running on 1901 software in a context that's changed. Now, when he says 1901 software, he's, he's, he's not necessarily referring to technology. Okay? As you'll see here, he's talking about we are antiquated in the way we've thought, the way we've seen things, and times have changed, and so we need to change too. He says... This 1901 software that I'm talking about is characterized by religious exclusivism, emphasis on doctrinal correctness, and external behavior before one can belong. Now, 
There, there are certain principles, friends, that, that, uh, that as Christians we follow and, and that, that as Adventists we teach that when you come to Christ, you, you should follow. This is why we have a series of baptismal vows, right? We go over these things in Bible studies because there's got to be an understanding of what it means to be a Christian and a disciple of Christ before you become part of his church. It just makes sense. But in the mind of many, and again, obviously this is happening within the church, this seems like too much like religious exclusivism, an emphasis on that. So notice, the 1901 software, according to him, the way we used to think is about, yeah, religious exclusivism, uh, an emphasis on doctrinal correctness and external behavior. Now, again, there, there, there are times when maybe we overemphasize that without a relationship with Jesus, and that's something we all obviously need to do better. But we can't throw the baby with the bathwater and say that this is no longer important because that's the way they used to think back in there, the 1901 software. Times have changed and we need to change with it too. This is dangerous. He says despite having results in the past, so obviously our 1901 software has had results in the past. There are voices calling for Adventism to recalibrate itself and candidly confront some of the downsides and problems that will stifle mission in the post-COVID-19 world. So again, we need to recalibrate. We need to change because if not, we're going to stifle our message because times, things have changed post-COVID-19. You know, again, you may read this and say, okay, well, that sounds, that sounds good. That sounds eloquent. There may be some truth to this, but be careful. Be careful because what he's calling us to do is to do away with our distinctiveness. Let me give you an example because he, he um, uh, names some problems. Again, this is a longer article. I don't share everything uh, that he wrote, but, but he names some of the problems. And here's one of them. As he sees, the problems as he sees in the church. An approach to mission that is deeply eschatological and often focused on proving how other groups are wrong. Now, there's two things there. Let me take that, that second part, proving it all, you know, all the groups are wrong. That should never be our strategy. Okay? It should never be our strategy because this is not about who's right or who's wrong. It's about what is right and what is wrong. Now, as we'll see, sometimes when you, when you talk about what is wrong, you cannot help but mention some individuals or some religious groups. It's just common sense. But I, it doesn't work. Trust me, because... Uh, um, the strategy is, is actually, it, it turns people off. I, I myself, uh, in my early years as a Christian, um, always enjoying Bible prophecy and the like, uh, uh, when any, whenever I had an opportunity to speak, uh, uh, have a spiritual conversation with a person of a different denomination, I always use the strategy of proving that I was right and you're wrong. It never works. It never works. But notice here, he, is, um, he, he believes that part of our problem is that we are, our mission is deeply eschatological. Now, eschatology is the study of end times. So as Adventists, what he's saying is that we were focused too much on end times. So we need to change that because that's part of the problem. But friends... When we look at the Bible and the message for this time, if we're living in the end times, then we need to have a message that is applicable for today. But no, we need to do away with this. We cannot do away with our eschatology because that's what the message of the three angels is all about. It's all about. And so he makes certain recommendations. He makes certain recommendations. Here's, I just want to share two of them with you. Church attendance is no longer a determinant of commitment. With the many online options available, how many, uh, many now see church attendance as a fringe activity that, no long, that, is, uh, that has no bearing on one's faithfulness to God or commitment to the church. Many are becoming more skeptical of the church as an institution. 
Now, I will agree in one statement that he said that church attendance does not determine commitment. That is true. You can come to church every week and not have a relationship with Jesus. So coming to church, in essence, doesn't say anything about your commitment to Christ. But again, beware. Because what, what, what Satan's strategy is, is to take everything to the extreme. Uh, you know, COVID-19, she yeah, sure taught us, taught us a whole lot of things. Of course, we here in Nashville first, even before COVID-19, had our live stream and everything. But a lot of churches didn't. And they learned the hard way, and they put this in, in motion. And we're thankful for technology, friends. We're thankful that, that, that we have a method to, to still communicate and, and have a worship service, even though, I, quite frankly, I, I really don't like them. We had to do it two weeks ago because of the, the, the snow and the ice. And again, we're thankful that we could do it. But this should never be a permanent thing, friends. No, no, no. Because see, Satan knows that, that part of the church experience is being face-to-face with each other. It's important and it's healthy for the Christian. And, and, I, and I've shared with you before, uh, and I'll share it again, we need to take steps in order to grow spiritually. Prayer, Bible study, spiritual exercise through witnessing, and being actively involved in the church. And it's got to be more than just the online experience. And I say that respectfully. I know some of you are watching online, and, and, and in some cases there are people who can't make it to church. I, we understand that. There's reasons for some people because of health or whatever. They cannot make it, friends. But this is where we need to be. And to say that it no longer matters is a mistake. I told you before, you know, the, the experience of COVID-19, and we were one of the, chur- the, the, the churches that did close. And, but I've told you before, not, never again. As far as I can, I, I'm concerned, as, and, and, and as far as a control that I, that, that I have control over this, we will not do this again because this is important. Amen. It's important. But there are many who are saying, well, maybe it's not important anymore. Be careful. Be careful. Here's the other one. No matter what Adventism says about itself or how much it self-identifies as the remnant, this no longer has weight. That's what he says. Our approach of readying ourselves in the book of Revelation and building our brand by criticizing others is becoming repulsive. That's what he's saying. The danger for our church is to be so wrapped up in its vision and mission that it fails to listen to what its constituency are saying. So what is the constituency saying? Because this is apparently part of the problem that many in our church believe, well, we need to start doing something different. Remnant, that's too exclusive. Let's stop calling ourselves a remnant. That's not important anymore. The book of Revelation, which is where the present truth is, well, that's no longer important anymore. Be careful. Be careful. What is the constituency saying? You know, uh, uh, one of the things that I've learned, you know, in giving Bible studies and, and, and having evangelistic campaigns, especially when I talk to people from, uh, say, other denominations, one of the things that they have said to me, you know, Pastor, we don't hear about these things in our church anymore. We don't, we don't hear about prophecy and revelation in, in our church anymore. And, and friends, believe it or not, people are yearning for this. And, and, and with good reason. They're yearning for it. And, and I suppose one of the reasons that uh, our friends from other denominations don't talk about these things anymore is because, remember, the, one of the most common, or if not the most common, uh, um, theory about uh, end of time has to do with secret rapture. And, and in, in essence, those who believe in that believe that they're not going to be even on earth when these things ha- start to happen. So why even bother studying that? I'm not going to be here to, to, to witness it. Let's not talk about it. That should not be us. That should not be us, friends. Yeah, we need to study the book of Revelation. See, some, of us, some, some voices, apparently, are seeking for us to be more like the other churches. Let's just be like them. It's more inviting. I'm concerned, friends, that, that many are becoming like the children of Israel. You remember? 
1 Samuel chapter 8, they, they ask Samuel, please give us a king that, that, that will judge us to be like the other nations. The children of Israel wanted so much to be like everybody else that they lost their distinctiveness and they lost their message. We cannot let that happen, friends. We cannot compromise. You know, we were talking about this uh, in our uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting. Um, part of it, of, of losing our distinctiveness, we were, we were actually talking about uh, uh, the issue of uh, dress and adornment. Right? Dress and adornment. And e even in that area, we've become like everybody else. And I remember, I mentioned this uh, uh, in our prayer meeting, that back in the day, uh, a number of years ago, C.D. Brooks preached a message. What was it called, Sherman? I want my church back. I want my church back. Some of you may have heard this, C.D. Brooks. And he, he, he comments that there used to be a time when a, when a Seventh-day Adventist was walking down the street, everybody knew that person was a Seventh-day Adventist. That's not the case anymore. Why? Because even in dress and, 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 and adornment, we've compromised and become like everybody else. We've lost our distinctiveness, friends, and there are people who want our message to go away too, friends. That should not happen. That should never happen. Yeah, friends, we, we need to... Uh, it's, it's true we need to do a better job in connecting with people and, 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 and um, you know, making feel people perhaps welcome and connected and, and, and family. But this has always been the case. This is, is not, this, that's nothing, nothing new. That is nothing new. But we can never change our message, even when people may feel uncomfortable about it, even if it may not be politically correct. We must proclaim it with love, but we must proclaim it. Let's, let's be honest. When we, when we think about, for example, the second angel's message, it talks about Babylon has fallen. When it talks about Babylon's daughters, we cannot say, well, I'm not going to preach that because it's not politically correct anymore because it mentions the Antichrist and all those things. No, friends, this is the message. And God thinks it's important to prepare the world to meet God. If we don't give it, Satan gets away with it. This is why God has raised the Seventh-day Adventist church for such a time as this. Testimonies to the church, volume 9, page 19. Ellen White says that the most solemn truth ever entrusted to mortals have been given to us to proclaim to the world. The, the proclamation of these truths is to be our work. The world is to be warned and God's people are to be true to the tr uh, trust committed to them. That is you, friends. We must be true to the trust committed to us. Some people are uncomfortable with it, but this is the message. We must not compromise. So I started the message asking you a question. Do you know who you are? Are you an eagle or are you a chicken? Well, if you receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, you are a child of God. You're a child of God. If you are a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, friends, you belong to God's final remnant movement, a movement that God has uh, listed up, raised for such a time as this. Huh? And while your salvation is not dependent upon being a Seventh-day Adventist, again, we as Seventh-day Adventists have never believed that you have to be an Adventist to be saved, and nor do we believe that every Adventist is going to be saved either. Because it is a relationship with Jesus. But if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, you better be paying attention to what the Adventist church is teaching and preaching, or at least they should be teaching and preaching, because if you don't, you run the risk of being deceived. And this is what Satan wants. He doesn't want anybody to know so that he can deceive as many as, as he wants. Are you an eagle or are you a chicken? Well, friends, you are an eagle. You are an eagle. God has meant you to proclaim this message from, from up high. This is why the, the three angels' message is uh, uh, on the sky, you know, in, in the midst of the sky, so everybody can hear it and everybody can see it. God has said, you know, I have, he has called you with a distinct message, right? I've made you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to proclaim to others what God has done for you. Let's do that, friends. We have a battle cry to sound. Let's not compromise. God has called you an eagle. Rise up your wings. Stretch out your wings and fly. Thanks for joining us. If you're ever in the Nashville area, come and visit us at the Nashville First Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
We're located at 2800 Blair Boulevard in Nashville, Tennessee. You may also visit us at nfsda.org.